for our customers or potential customers for that matter, if they're saying they don't want to talk to sales, it means that there's something wrong with the selling process. It means that we are solely focused or hyper focused on the transaction and the revenue that we have to gain. And obviously it's, it's part of the all of view of our organization, Mm -hmm. Um, but we've missed the opportunity to build a relationship that cascades across the transaction. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is a RevOps superstar. He's an established leader with a demonstrated history of scaling SaaS focused organizations from pilot to full deployment. Over his many years of experience, he's excelled in organizational design, leadership, sales, and customer success. He's passionate about creating a great employee experience and helping sales teams scale to create an amazing buyer experience. Vice President of Global Revenue Operations and Sales at Alight Solutions, Brady Johnson. Brady, good to talk to you. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. Um, this should be a fun conversation and obviously something I'm very passionate about. So, Yeah, and crazy enough, we met back at AISP in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and uh, got to connect. We found out, wow, what a small pool of, uh, of people that we've, we've kind of gotten to know over the years and went back through some of your experiences at some pretty large organizations. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I don't think we were quite in Tucson. We were somewhere near Tucson, you know, as close to the border as we could possibly find, but it was a, it was a wonderful few days of, uh, of learning uh, for me. And I think, you know, it was a a great event at AISP as well. And, and learning, especially the fact that I think tin cup was filmed at that golf course. And yeah, unlike yeah, isn't that funny. Yeah, <laughs> and unlike Tin Cup, RevOps is not something where you can just take a seven iron at everything. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, want to kick this off and start the same way I have with uh, a number of guests. You know, in the world of B two B sales today, we hear a lot of change, but some things tend to stay constant. So, what is the one soft skill that? sellers can focus on to create a big impact in both relationships and in revenue? Yeah, super interesting question. And, you know, I think in our discussions, this this question has taken a couple different, you know, lives. Um, and I think that it can take many, but at the end of the day, my opinion, um, and, you know, it's both based on observational, you know, views of the world, as well as, you know, where I've actually seen, you know, statistical relevance. But at the end of the day, for me, it comes down to customer experience. And, you know, when you talk about a soft skill, it doesn't directly correlate in my mind to customer experience. Those two things don't necessarily go together, but one impacts the other. So when I think about (coughs) customer experience, I truly think about, you know, how do we build EQ into every conversation that we have? Um, And how do we actually build that into our sales process? Um, it's something that I think can be built upon. Um, it's something that individuals can refine. And I think if you're thoughtful in regards to how those two things work together, you can actually drive a better and different result. But what I would say is, is it really starts with, hey, how do I ensure that I actually encapsulate and capture the value that our customers are really seeking at any given mo- moment in time? Mm-hmm. And how do I actually take that and say, hey, there's a process for capturing that value in the sales cycle to drive a better result. And how have you seen that play out? You've worked in RevOps at a number of organizations, Microsoft being one that's a a larger, more established. What are some of the kind of successful best practices that you've seen in that combination between, I gotta be human, but I've also got to turn it into a process. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's hard, right? You know, I think, Anybody that comes in or looks, you know, if, if you look at, you know, outside the window, looking in, you look at sales and you say, hey, is it really that hard? Well, nothing really happens from an organizational standpoint without us selling a product, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that is, it could be a service, it could be 
in healthcare, it could be an outcome. Um, but at the end of the day, something is being transacted upon. Therefore, you know, I think it, it's easy for us to dilute the value of sales. And in some experiences, I find sellers doing that as well. They dilute the value of their own role. And it's not intentional by any means. I think that we just oversimplify something that is wildly complex and it's very behavior oriented. So from a best practices standpoint, you know, I think, <clears throat> There's, there's two sides to any coin. And I could look at my experience from Infor, you know, as well as the net new perspective. And I could look at, you know, Microsoft as well as Alight. But really where I see individuals find their voice usually starts and ends with, what are you most passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that individuals get caught up on to a certain extent. Um, at the end of the day, you have to be passionate about whatever it is that you're providing, right? Whether that's a service, whether that's a product, or whether that's an outcome. Um, mm -hmm. And once you find that passion, I think it's very easy to socialize that passion with your prospective or current customers. And while you do that, there's a very methodical way of doing it, right? Um, you know, building a relationship with a client or a potential client in most circumstances isn't, you know, casual conversation, right? Yeah. Well, individuals love to ask me about the weather because I'm in Fargo, North Dakota, and it usually makes them feel better about wherever they're living at that moment <laughs> in time. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily move the needle. It doesn't make you and I have more of a relationship. We just talked about something that had zero value. And I think, you know, when you go back to it, best practice is how do I bring value to a conversation? Not for me, not a perceived value that I've thought about from a product standpoint, but how do I provide value to the end customer at the end of the day? And that is a question that can't be answered prior to the call. Um, I think in many circumstances, you can have an articulation of how your product drives value for a customer. You can talk, you can think through what the outcome might be that you're trying to drive. But at the end of the day, until you truly understand that customer, their needs, and the problem that they're trying to solve, not from an organization standpoint to start, but what is a problem that you can solve with the solution that you have, whether that's, you know, whether that's a good, a product, a service, or anything in the in between, is there a problem that they have today that you can solve for? And then, you know, flipping the script there for, for a second, there's this very pervasive methodology and I'm using it right now and it's not intentional. It's just, we've all been taught it for so long. Um, mm -hmm. And it's finding a problem and solving for it. Those are two things that don't actually drive a transformational outcome. You've just found an issue and you're hoping to resolve for it. It hasn't gotten to value. It could be valuable for the individual momentarily. It could be valuable for the organization momentarily, but it hasn't actually tied itself to an outcome. An outcome mm -hmm. could be a business-based outcome. It could be an organizational outcome. It could tie directly to their five-year vision as a company. And the second that you can move from, not only am I driving value for the individual I'm speaking to, not only am I driving value for the organization, but I've already tied my value to the outcomes of the firm, not today, not tomorrow, but years down the line, I think that that's a winning methodology that we all need to be thinking about. Easier said than done, but something that is, you know, probably one of the best practices when done right. Well, and it's the, it's the long play. I mean, I, I think of you're in a RevOps role that not only has to build a sales methodology that meets the buyer where they are, tough in today's yeah. market, meets a buyer that's hyper-educated, but I would say hyper-educated down to maybe 10 feet of water level, right? Not to say that buyers aren't educated. I don't want to get feedback there. But I think the seller, it's in the nuance. It's in the customization for that company, for that RevOps leader, understanding exactly where they are. That is where that seller can add value that today, if it's just Brady getting on with a brand new SDR, you're so far deep into RevOps and knowing all of your concerns and everything else, you don't need an hour therapy session with a BDR to tell them all your challenges, <laughs> to have them come back and give you a, well, this is what we see with people like you generalized statement. Would, would you agree to that? Is that kind of, I think, where we can take those experiences and make them better? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's a super, you touch on a, 
a number of hot topics. Um, <laughs> One, you know, the value of an initial conversation, and you, you, you know, you spoke about it, BERs and SDRs, whatever you want to call it, from a taxonomy perspective. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a super challenging area right now, and there's a lot of reasons for it. But um, the other piece of it is, is our buyers are spending more time and energy defining what it is that they truly want to solve for before they ever have a conversation with us, and a lot of that comes back to the technology that individuals have created we can now capture more information as individuals before ever talking. You know, if we were in a selling experience today, I could spend hours or weeks or months doing research. Now, most individuals aren't, but they can do a lot of pre-work in regards to trying to truly understand what they're hoping to accomplish. And when they come into that discussion, you know, and the data will tell you maybe they're 40% down the road, maybe they're 55% down the road. And that's a challenging environment for a seller because one, in most circumstances, that individual has either done enough research that, you know, they've gleaned insights based on product information, right? Mm -hmm. They've gone online and they've researched whatever it might be, say forecasting methodology or forecasting process. You know, what, what is technology, what is a technology that can help me better understand my forecast and you know how do i move towards a predictive forecast methodology mm -hmm. well <clears throat> you're going to ask a question like that on whatever site if you're wanting to do some research and there's going to be a thousand options of providers that do just that and they're going to be subject matter experts they're <laughs> going to be pushing out materials that will tell you this is what you need to care about and those are not in any way shape or form objective in nature they are extremely subjective and it's based on the product that they actually provide right so i think you know where we have the greatest opportunity starts with customer experience right you know in an ideal world you and i would know each other in a selling process far before i started thinking about researching the product that i'm going to go purchase from you or any other vendor, we've already built that relationship. And I think that starts with EQ and that starts with, you know, this continuous opportunity to be engaging with prospective clients in a different way that doesn't necessarily say, hey, I'm calling you because I want something from you, which is generally some type of transaction, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm calling you because I actually think that there's more value in me calling you and telling you something about what we do or what we can do long term than it is a burden to you. And I think if you come into the conversation saying, hey, I have something, whether that's a product or service or just a question um, that can move you farther down the line of thinking through this long term, well, that gives you the opportunity to go have that conversation in the future. And hopefully it prevents them going out and doing their own market research because we all know when it comes to competition, they're going to find a thousand different pieces of information in the marketplace that will tell them what they should do. And usually it's by a vendor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's bias. I mean, let's be honest. We're all a product marketer here. You write the RFP template to somewhat serve into. I mean, you want it to be <laughs> unobjectional, but you know, like because it has to be believable. It has to be value add. But if you put yourself as, I'm not just trying to position a product. I'm trying to truly, based on what I see in the ecosystem, give Brady a great RFP template. Then it yeah. can be helpful, but you're right. It's almost like if a seller can get in at that point when they're kind of building expectation for that forecasting solution, adding value in terms of kind of understanding the market research and the market understanding, you have a better chance probably having a good sales experience further down the line. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And interestingly enough, like when you bring that up, you know, at Infor, we, we got to a point that we felt like we had a pretty solid sales process. Mm -hmm. And we thought that it hit all of the things that our customers would need to evaluate. And win or lose, we would share that information. Um, if we didn't get down selected, we said, we would say, hey, we understand why, uh, for whatever reason that might be. Maybe we weren't the right fit. Maybe we came in too high. Maybe we didn't appropriately articulate our value because that is a hard thing to do in certain times. Very tough. Depending on what we're trying to accomplish. But what we started to do is we would just share a process, right? Of just saying, hey, at the end of the day, 
you still have 30% of this process left. And we hope that this can provide you some understanding as to how we approach your sales process. Here are the steps that I think you should go through. Here are the steps that you should take. And you should be very thoughtful about making sure that you get these questions answered. And you should talk with your prospective vendor up front about what you want to accomplish. Interestingly enough, did we have an influx of customers come back and end up purchasing from us because of that? No, not necessarily, but we did have some. And we also had a number of them come back and thank us for saying, hey, you want to know what? We had a process in our mind, but it missed step 54 or 65, right? Because it's a highly complex investment that they're making. Mm -hmm. And it helped us realize what the value is truly going to be. And I have to think when you put that together, you're doing them a favor. You're giving that to them and saying, here's the process that we built as experts in the space to really vet out and understand what these solutions can do, see all the blind corners, all the, you know, the traps that might be leading your way or the things that could be causing issues down the road. If they didn't come back that time, how did you see in terms of just brand affinity, people going back to your sellers to ask questions or potentially if something went wrong down the road as, as, as an account churned out, moved solutions as we all tend to do every few years? Yeah, it was quite common. I mean, at that day, I've had customers come back to me um, many years later, and it's 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 become less prevalent now. Um, but when I was an account executive at Infor in the healthcare space, I had individuals call me throughout my tenure at it, at Microsoft, and they knew that I was no longer with the organization, but they would have questions. They say, "Hey, you know, do you know so and so within the organization? Do you know how you can help me with this?" I didn't work there anymore, but I was happy to answer the question. Because those relationships are gold, right? Like yeah. those are the greatest opportunities. And you know, as as a seller, it you know filled my cup to a certain extent because they saw value in me, not the organization. You know, they obviously saw the value in, in in the product that we provided them at one point, but they saw value in calling me up, knowing that I didn't work there anymore, to ask some questions, and that was hugely beneficial and you know maybe it was an ego boost too but it was fun to have those discussions and try to help where i could well and it's it's to your point you know you said it's not about just talking about the weather and becoming friends it's a commercial relationship yeah. but if in that commercial relationship you can position yourself whether it be by the sales process or the value you add as that trusted advisor all of a sudden you've elevated yourself and, and sellers nowadays, I think more than ever are hired guns to some extent, right? The James Bonds of the, uh, of the organization or the performance athlete, so to say. And so yeah. a lot of the times it's like, if you can be that trusted advisor, great for your career and great for any company then that you come to. In that That's time. absolutely right. Yeah. And the hope is, is like, you're never going to have a one-to-one -one relationship where, you know, all of your prospective customers and current customers will call you for advice in the future. Uh, but the hope is, is that some will reach out and it's not because, you know, they didn't know where else to go. They knew exactly where you went. They knew that you can't necessarily be an internal advocate, but they also realized that you had more to provide than a transactional relationship. And I think that's where you just said the word transactional, you know, 44% was the recent statistic I read and, and could vary by industry and things like that. But 40, 44% of millennial buyers, which are the largest segment of buyers in today's market, never want to talk to sales. Yeah, I, I'm not at all surprised. Yeah. It blows my mind. And I think, you know, this goes back to the fact that, you know, we started this conversation with selling's hard, right? Yeah. And I, anybody that says that it's not maybe has either had an awesome product and solution that was time <laughs> to be sold in the marketplace or, or the right territory at the time. But anyone that's been doing it for a long period of time knows that you will see the highs of a mountaintop and some very, very dark valleys. And if done right, you can minimize, you know, the ups and downs and really, you know, drive consistency. Um, but for our customers or potential customers for that matter, if they're saying they don't want to talk to sales, it means that there's something wrong with the selling process. It means that we are solely focused or hyper-focused on the transaction 
and the revenue that we have to gain, and obviously it's it's part of the all of view of our organization, mm-hmm. um, but we've missed the opportunity to build a relationship that cascades across the transaction, and it, and it's something more important. I think you know you see that in in the world that we have today, especially in the tech sector, right? You know, from sales development through all of the transitions that you see that a customer has to go through. And then there's churn, you know, maybe they have a customer success manager or an account manager or whatever it might be from a taxonomy perspective, but they transition or cycle through that as well. Well, that becomes hard, right? Because they're getting whiplash every time that they make that transition. They're probably answering a lot of questions that they've already, you know, answered historically. Four, five, six times, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are the same 20 questions? I'll give you a document and just send it over to the next person. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then, you know, they start to look at it and say, well, why is this so valuable to me? And I think that that starts to glean, you know, some insights into this emerging um, transition to a more technical workforce um, from a selling capacity. And I think that that's as dangerous as it is opportunistic, to be perfectly honest, because when you think about EQ, I think that's something that absolutely can be developed. Mm -hmm. You have to have someone that's passionate about building relationships, because if you're not, it will naturally be transactional. There's no way or form that you're going to force somebody say that it's hyper focused on product that doesn't really want to build a relationship. They want to talk product they can develop some of that EQ or some of the soft skill, but it's very challenging if they truly don't want to go out to a customer and have some of these hard conversations up front. It's hard to get them to do that, right? They have to have a natural passion for it. And I think becoming more technical gives us an opportunity to show our depth and capability. Um, but it can also be dangerous if, if not thought through and not making sure that you're really thinking about the end result, which is the customer experience. Well, because you just you mentioned that and it's like that technical sale. I always think of that person that that shows up and just gives you all of the demo, every feature, every capability. And I think the piece that you're pointing to on the EQ side is know your audience, read the room and then respond in a way that's going to move the needle forward for them. Don't give me the whole picture give me the three or four pieces that matter. And that goes back to that sales process, right? It's like knowing what are those pieces that are gonna matter. Yeah, and it's hard too, right? Like you're asking somebody that has spent potentially years developing their skill set. Like I think mm-hmm. about, you know, if, if you look at platform as a technology, right? So we could look at Azure, which is something that I spent a lot of time and energy on. You could look at AWS, which, you know, I know quite well as well, or GCP, whatever it is. Um, individuals spend time, a relentless amount of time and energy obtaining certification, right? From mm-hmm. a technical capability standpoint. And they've seen, you know, talk about looking through the forest, through the trees, right? Um, They've seen what this technology can do and they're passionate about it and they should be. They've invested in immaterial, well, a material amount of time Mm -hmm. um, trying to understand how it actually drives outcomes for, for customers. And it's something of a passion project. And interestingly enough, like when I was at Microsoft, some of the greatest innovations that we saw were from t- some of our technical sales reps. They saw a problem within our organization and they built an application for it, right? Or they built something on Azure platform to actually resolve for it. Now, <clears throat> they get into a conversation, they're naturally going to be passionate about the product and they're going to want to talk about all of the features. Yeah. And that, I think, you know, in some sort of way has an opportunity with a customer too of just stating it up front, right? You know, why is it that you're working for Microsoft within Azure? Or why are you working at Amazon with, within AWS? Well, talk about your passions, right? Because individuals can understand that and they can comprehend like, you know, when you get excited and you want to talk about the 19th feature you didn't need to discuss, it can be a laughable moment for everyone, right? Like they can understand where you're coming from, not because you want to berate them with the understanding that you have, it's truly because there's a love and passion for the solution that you provide. Now, there's also educational moments in that too, right? 
We got to just turn back to self-awareness, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which can be hard because you get into a conversation just like this, right? Mm-hmm. And you go down a tangent and you didn't know that you were going to, you know, kind of expose this capability and you realize that it can do something. Well, at the end of the day, it's an educational moment for everyone. And this is something which is a practice in nature, right? Like if selling and sales process was a black and white answer, right? If you do these five things and you drive this result. Well, one, I, it wouldn't be the organization that it is today in any company. And two, we probably would have figured out how to automate it by now. True. True. If there wasn't all of the variables and all of the craziness that goes into both the logical side, the emotional side of that decision-making process of that deal. Yeah. You, you have the greatest variable in the world in that conversation, which is people, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and how we react to different commentary, right? And does it resonate? Does it not resonate? Um, do we actually have, can we build a relationship? Sometimes you can't, right? And that's hard. Yep. But, and we found sometimes, right? That, that passionate person, they can be the most convincing, but they can also be the most challenging to get the deal done sometimes because you just want to keep them into smaller segments and highlight specifics again from the lens of of that buyer. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we started this conversation, customer experience came up and it all goes back to process in my mind. If you're methodical about what you want to accomplish with your customer and you're transparent about it, but saying, hey, based on the conversation, this is what I think we need to do next. That's not the next step. I, you know, hey, I'd like to demo the product for you. Well, that's great, right? Like everybody would love to see what the capability can be. You might not be there yet, right? Like, cause you're actually not gonna provide a demonstration that resonates with the client. But if you give them the steps of how they need to make this decision based on your expertise, cause at the end of the day, we should be the ones that do it the most. Mm-hmm. Organizations don't buy products a dime a dozen, but sellers go through sales process potentially 10, 15, if it's transactional, hundreds, if mm-hmm. not many of hundreds, multiples <laughs> yeah. of hundreds of sales cycles, we should know how to do it and do it right. And we should be the, the subject matter expert. I think that that's what we lose in some of that conversation, right? You, you quickly want to build a relationship and that's super important. But customer experience comes down to sales process. And Mm -hmm. once you pack an EQ of thoughtfully, you know, implementing some ideation on how do you show value to the individual you're speaking to today? How do you drive value and show value to the organization? And then how do you start to tie that value to the outcomes of the company? Well, that's a winning strategy. Well, and that's a sales process built around the needs of your buyer rather than built around, well, at stage one, I'd like you to interrogate the person. At stage (laughs) two, I'd like you to tell them everything we do. And then at stage three, I'd like to make sure that you uh, go through the security review. Like, because that's never what the buyer wants to go through. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so in regards to your role in RevOps, what keeps you up at night? What, what are some of those challenges you're facing? Well, I think RevOps is this, you know, very Im- ambiguous thing, depending mm-hmm. on the organization that you're in at any given moment in time, um, similar to customer success, you know, maybe in the last five to 10 years, it takes a different view depending on the organization that you're in and, and that you serve. But for me, um, we're, we're on this path of transformation of really, you know, moving from sales operations to this revenue operations function. And what that means, you know, from an organizational perspective is really stepping back and saying, how do we drive the right outcomes for our organization first and foremost? And what that, what that does is you start to step away from saying every dollar is made the same. And you start saying dollars are made very differently. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is an intended to be, you know, coincidental by, you know, what's happening with the U.S. dollar um, at this day and age. But it is something that's going to become extremely important in the marketplace when you start to look at, you know, the markers that we see, you know, from an economic standpoint, 
inflation is at an all time high, um, you're seeing individuals have apprehension and you're seeing, you know, from a global economic standpoint, individuals are starting to talk about what the U.S. dollar is going to do. Well, <clears throat> it makes more it just it, it solidifies the need for us to look at revenue in a different way. And what keeps me up at night is saying, hey, we need to drive fast business outcomes. And that doesn't mean that, you know, it's it's revenue and revenue alone. It's it's the right revenue at the right time that actually drives profitable growth. Um, and it's something we've always talked about as organizations. It's something that's super important for any company that's growing. Um, but with the economy the way that it is, I think it's going to be one of the most important levers that anybody has to weather through the storm. And to do that and do it appropriately, it's really looking in and saying, hey, how do we drive more value for our customers? How do we drive the right value for our customers that drive the right value to our organization and potentially our, our shareholders as well? Mm -hmm. um, but most importantly, how do we differentiate between the right pursuit and the wrong pursuit from a selling standpoint? And if anybody spent any time selling in the past, they will know that in, in their heart of hearts, they will know the deals that they never should have been involved in. Because one, it wasn't the right deal for the company. Two, it wasn't the right deal for the customer. And three, it certainly wasn't the right deal for you. You, mm -hmm. you exuded a ton of energy to get to a no. And that no, you knew on day one, um, was it was not going to be the right fit, or we would not drive value, or we would not be able to drive the outcome that we, we hoped. And it's heartbreaking, right? It's hard to walk yeah. away. And in many circumstances, you know, you have a competitive group of individuals that want to succeed. And sometimes we can be blinded by that, right? Yeah. And in RevOps, there's an opportunity for us to really showcase where our opportunity lies and where we should pursue and where we should walk away. And that's, it's a complicated thing that we're working on on a daily basis. And I don't think that anybody's ever going to get it a hundred percent right, but there's data to tell you where you should pursue and where you should step back. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and right now, like you're saying, more and more decisions are moving up to a CFO, more and more decisions are getting pushed out, more and more decisions are moving into proof of concept trial. Let me show you the value before you commit. How does RevOps play into that? Because I can only imagine that that's got to that's got to make this whole sales process a lot more convoluted or a lot tougher to work through. Yeah, I, it certainly does. And it doesn't all at the same time. I mean, if you go mm -hmm. back to the fundamentals of the right sales process, driving the right customer experience, tying that to organizational value and ultimately outcomes, um, that naturally fits in to what we hope to accomplish from a RevOps standpoint. Now, where things get complicated, I think, in many circumstances is the level that we speak to. Um, and this is, you know, again, I, I think all of us have done it. Um, if you've ever spent any time selling, you've talked to somebody that's passionate about the solution that you can provide, but has no authority to make it a, a decision. And I think knowing that early, and then also pulling in the resources that you need to say, hey, we either need to significantly change the level that we're speaking to, because at the end of the day, we're going to exude a ton of time and energy, which is a cost to the company, by the way. Yeah. Not only an opportunity cost, but there's a fixed cost of your seller spending time in areas that are not going to drive a result. If you can get smarter with that information and actually start to transition your sales organization, Mm -hmm. to a more methodical approach. That is the outcome of revenue operations in many circumstances. It's a thousand other things as well of making sure that we're actually driving profitable growth. But at the end of the day, if you can start there and make sure that you're, you're, you're uh, executing on the right pursuits, that has a material impact to everything upline and everything downline as well. So what are the, some of the things that you've worked on in terms of really helping sellers identify those in-market good to move deals versus who let's, let's not keep reeling on this one. Get the line out of the water. You're, you're wasting, you're wasting time. Cut bait, move on. Yeah. Um, I, 
there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'll take some of my time at Microsoft as an example. Um, mm-hmm. There's always an interesting opportunity to talk to a customer, especially if they're trying to do something transformational. Um, mm-hmm. However, there's usually clear indicators on whether or not they're one, um, a real buyer, and two, they can actually execute on a strategy, or they are individuals that are hopeful and or curious, right? Um, and if I cascade that across, you know, a different sales cycle or a different approach, what I would say is, is that, you know, our greatest opportunity from a RevOps standpoint is data, right? It goes back to the conversation that we were having. Mm-hmm. We should be subject matter experts in regards to sales pursuits because sellers should be doing more sales pursuits than any customer at any given moment in time. And if that's inverted, it'll tell you something as well. If the customer says, hey, we we review vendors, you know, by the truckloads, well, that would be very concerning to me as a seller, right? Because at yeah. the end of the day, why are you purchasing so much? Or two, why are you spending so, t- so much time and energy um, reviewing a vendor relationship? Is that just because it's a cost cutting nature or is, is there something to be said for that? Um, so I think, you know, utilizing the data that we have at our fingertips and that, that you know, for my organization starts and ends with, how do we ensure that we have the information we need from a sales technology perspective to actually mm-hmm. drive insights and results back to our sellers of saying, hey, we've actually captured this information, not because you know we you know just have an evil grin on our face and want you to put something into Salesforce that nobody's ever going to use again. Lord <laughs> knows individuals can resonate with that because we don't always define the why behind why we're capturing information. Yeah. But actually taking that information in a way where we can utilize it to drive a different outcome. And then, you know, secondarily, we have a business health team, which doesn't sit under me, but sits under, you know, an extremely talented individual. His name is Jorge. Uh, you should talk to him at a, at a future date, actually. He is Perfect. he's one of my favorite people within the organization. But, you know, he's taking this and, you know, he's working on different platforms that go down to the sales leader and seller um, to actually start to define where our greatest opportunity is. And that's white spacing and TAM, but it's also, you know, starting to isolate where we have broader opportunity based on the insights we can see within the marketplace, which, you know, all starts and ends with capturing data in a way that you can drive a different result. When I love how earlier you were saying part of your job right now is moving from sales ops to rev ops, right? Kind of that evolution. And, and yeah. I think what's fascinating by that is as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking rev ops for you is really the ability to listen to what's going on in marketing, listen to what's going on in sales and through the sales process. And then based on those data points, really start to understand and surface what good looks like back to your sellers so that they can be effective. Like that's That's absolutely right. But that's different than how most people look at RevOps. I think most people look at RevOps as like, like you said before, the CRM fields and is the deal desk ready to go when I go put a, a deal in and is the, you know, can they get the signing and are the numbers right in the proposal? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, when you start to look at it, um, an all-encompassing view of revenue operations, right? Mm-hmm. The hope is if done appropriately, right? And I think it's a really challenging thing to get right because there's so many moving pieces and there's so much evolution happening in the marketplace today. But you should be able to pull a single thread from the start of a customer engagement, wherever that is, if it's in sales development or somewhere else, and pull that across every internal and external organization within your company Mm -hmm. and say, not only is our voice consistent, but our data told us that by following this path, we were going to drive a different result. So it starts, you know, say we had a fantastic conversation with the sales development rep. Um, You know, we get our, our account executive engaged that continues to progress along. Well, then there's a lot of things that happen after that, right? And you've touched on some of them. So we have negotiations and contracts, right? So the Mm -hmm. contract process you have, you know, maybe they go out to RFP. So, you know, is your SDR actually speaking the same language as your RFP team, 
right? Yeah. Are we actually looking at the same piece of value that we started the conversation with? Because if those two things don't add up, you, it looks like you're two different organizations and it's very common, right? Like when you start to think about it, there's all these things that need to fall into place in a systematic approach. And if you can make sure that, you know, one, you're speaking the same language and two, you're driving towards the same outcome, cascading across all your internal organizations, that drives a better customer experience. Yep. And, and it eliminates those handoffs because I can think of it. It could be two things. It could be the game of telephone. SDR yep. sets expectations about what your product can or should do. AE comes on board and goes, okay, this is what you heard. Yep, that's what you're excited about. Awesome. Let me tell you more. And then by the time you're in this process, what was really exciting and interesting to the buyer is totally convoluted and lost. And now you're trying to get back to that initial conversation that actually hooked them and that they wanted to buy on. Yeah. And then you look back at it and there's like from sales methodology, right? Yep. Maybe you missed step five and seven, right? What does that actually do at step 57, which is the step of closing a contract? Well, you missed a very critical part of that process and what happens in those moments, right? From a selling capacity standpoint. Well, that deal pushes a quarter, maybe yep. two. Maybe that deal becomes more at risk because we missed a critical point or we realized we we're talking to the wrong person because we didn't ask a simple but complicated question of who needs to be in the room at that moment in time. Or maybe we were speaking to the wrong people in the room. And that's something that's extremely complicated, right? Of like actually engaging individuals, especially virtually. You and I talked about it in our prep call, yeah. right? You know, <laughs> try, I call it the reverse, you know, bell curve. Other individuals call it the valley of despair. Um, <laughs> I like the reverse bell curve because it's not quite uh, as terrifying, but how do you engage an entire room in a conversation where they're actually one, actively listening, and two, actively engaged in the sales process so they get exactly what they need out of those discussions and they can drive towards the result that you're hoping to accomplish. Well, and you're spot on. We're doing research right now on some of the needs of virtual sellers and, and where buyers see themselves. And it's like sellers totally believe they're keeping the audience engaged. Buyers, uh, yeah, I wasn't that engaged on most of these calls. Right. Just that little <laughs> fact right there, the disconnect between buyers and sellers. And then you add in, like you said, that reverse bell curve where I may be really excited about this technology at first. I, as a buyer, might even be passionate about solving my problem. But then when I start to learn the pain and the struggle or the challenge that it's going to be or just the journey to fix it, I got to have somebody that can kind of lift me up and ensure that I can get through that buying process and that it is worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly enough, like we found, um, and this is many years ago that we did, you know, some studies on our own of, mm -hmm. you know, hey, when we engaged in a conversation, if we were outright and just very honest about the selling process, mm -hmm. say selling a new ERP to a customer, if we just said, Hey, here are all the things that you're going to have to do internally. Here are all yeah. the things that we're going to have to do internally. Here's the time commitment that we anticipate on both sides. Have you thought about this? And we have individuals running for the hills, right? You know, they're like, no, you want to know what? This is a great conversation. I just don't think that I have it in me to go through this process. And in other moments they would say, and, and that's great, right? Yeah. Like, you have Not some sellers right now listening going, oh my gosh, don't do that. They're scaring everybody <laughs> away. But to your point, going back to this, if you really want velocity and predictability in your in your sales process. Yeah. Well, and interestingly enough, you know, your customer might, or potential customer, however you want to define it, might come to you and say, you want to know what? You're crazy. It shouldn't take this much time and energy to, to go through the evaluation process. And you go back to providing them the process that you've set forth and they can go to a different vendor. And what they realize is the lack there of transparency in regards to the complicated and time consuming process frustrates people mm -hmm. to no end. It's frustrating for me. I mean, nobody wants to talk. I mean, you look at consumer experience or, you know, buying experiences today as a consumer, 
which I think we forget about in the business setting. Like mm-hmm. every one of us, even if we have authority to spend company dollars on a solution, we buy as a consumer and a consumer first. And yep. luckily enough, we have you know a small brick that runs our lives. Usually it's an Apple product, but other individuals don't always subscribe and that's perfectly fine. But they, we expect consumer experience. We expect consumer grade applications. We expect yep. the process to be easy. I mean, you go through, you know, I've been going through a journey myself of, you know, starting to get more active and be more mindful of, you know, how I spend my time outside of work. Mm -hmm. And I went through an application the other day and I said, you want to know what? This is worth my time. Well, 72 questions later, if they would have just said, hey, take 30 minutes, be frustrated because we're going to ask questions from, you know, your great, great grandmother's history, um, I would have said, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. And our sellers are the same way, right? Like, be honest about what you're hoping to accomplish. Be honest about what the process is and be honest about the investment. And if individuals want to say no to that, that's perfectly fine because you can try to skip steps or consolidate things. But in most circumstances, that comes up to bite any seller at the end of the line, right? Because yeah. we, we didn't answer a question that we should have. We didn't answer a question that they truly needed because we tried to fit within to their sales process. And sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can, but the outcome is, is that you don't get the result that you want, but you exuded so much effort to get there. It's because you skip steps, right? Yeah. So transparency is key in the relationship. Or, or you don't get the adoption or whatever it might be. And, yeah. and I think that's, you know, self-awareness, self-awareness of yourself as a seller, but also awareness of like what it does take to have this solution be successful. Everybody wants the magic pill, but at a certain point, like (laughs) you have to realize, hey, if I want to go run a marathon, I got to get out there and put on my tennis shoes every single day. If you're not willing to do that or or often, then you're probably not going to have a great time running the marathon. Like it, it all, it all adds up. I don't think we can defy gravity. So Brady, what are some of the things that excite you about the future? You know, what's something that that you're seeing is just, man, this is going to be a lot of fun to see take place over the next few years. Well, I think that there are the easy and the complex, right? Like Mm -hmm. um, anybody that you talk to in the next, you know, kind of six months, I think are are going to talk about conversational AI um, Mm -hmm. because it's super exciting, can be terrifying to some individuals as well. Um, But at the end of the day, it is, it's, it's on the world stage of what can this technology do? And I think that, you know, fundamentally, it has quite a significant opportunity for anyone at any level within any part of an organization. Now, it's interesting that we're talking about AI um, because that is not a new technology. Uh, no. Conversational AI is certainly, you know, coming along in a way in which you can actually drive a different result. So I'm very excited to see what that actually does, not just from a consumer standpoint, Mm -hmm. um, but from a business standpoint, I think that you're going to see, you know, a bit of an arms race um, within the tech sector on how do you actually monetize something like this Mm -hmm. and how to embed it very methodically in regards to the capability you can drive within your application set. The second piece is, is, We've never had so much information than we do today um, when it comes to consumer buyer behaviors and changing opinions on how they want to be engaged. Mm -hmm. I think that can be a dangerous thing um, because you're seeing more and more that individuals would rather not engage with the company because they believe that they have a decision. And you can see that within you know, the platform space, right? With AWS and, and, and Azure as an example, I mean, individuals don't need to talk to Microsoft or Amazon to sign up in a pay-as-you-go format in one way, shape, yeah. or form. Um, that, I think, you know, it's, it's super exciting to see organizations move down the line of a consumer-based engagement strategy because I do think it's extremely valuable. Um, I also think that it's really complicated, right? Because at the end of the day, you have this individual stepping into a relationship with a company with the expectation that they're not going to talk to someone because one, they don't believe that they need to, or two, 
they just don't want to. And I think that's, you know, that's nice for them. Mm-hmm. It's complicated for a business though. And I think that very is very complicated. Yeah. Because how do you build a relationship, right? You're not building the relationship at the jump. They might get frustrated on that application for whatever reason, because they don't understand it. They're not getting what they need. And Hey, maybe you have a customer success rep that's assigned to that account. They're trying to engage with that individual, but we've never had a relationship, right? So they are truly the SDR. And while it's a customer, it's really a prospective customer in my mind, because they're just as hard to get engaged. And by the time you get engaged with them, their experience with your organization was not within your control. It was entirely based on their own engagement. So that's the other piece that's really exciting and complicated and scary. Um, But I think it's a problem to solve. And there's plenty of organizations that are out there trying to figure out, you know, what does engagement look like? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that there's a great opportunity within that to really, you know, start to evolve the selling process and procedure to align to the new buyer behavior. Well, and now it's going to be like looking at, okay, I've got a bunch of users, maybe in a freemium or a a lower tier model. Now I need to analyze how that buyer or how that user that came on board now, how are they using the solution and what's going to get them to move up to that next tier or expand, right? So it's a, it's a whole nother challenge for RevOps to unlock. I'm excited to to continue this conversation a year or two down the road and uh, and see where that goes. Because I think you're on the pulse of something right now in terms of sales process, changing buyer trends, and just how do we meet these buyers with so many different needs when especially selling complex solutions? How do we meet them where they are? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, you know, like from a RevOps perspective, when you say, you know, there's a good dollar and there's a bad, I mean, it's terrifying to think that you have somebody spending a sign- any significant amount of money with your organization without a relationship, right? Because yeah. you don't know, like you have no idea if it's good or bad money because at the end of the day, you don't have a relationship. You don't know what they're trying to drive from an outcome standpoint. But I think there's opportunity in that, you know, even when you start to think through conversational AI, and the engagement in the buyer, um, there's there's some interesting opportunity in the marketplace that I'm going to be really, really curious about and very excited to see um, how organizations capitalize on it. Yeah, that'll be exciting to see. Well, Brady, you've had quite a, a professional career in RevOps and across sales, customer success, but take me back, okay? Take me back in time. How'd you get here? Tell me a little bit about little Brady and, and kind of where... Uh, where, where you got on this journey initially. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I would love to say that when I was five years old, I would uh, <laughs> I would dress up in a suit and tie uh, with a briefcase and, you know, walk into my office and start making cold calls, but that just wasn't the case. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it certainly was not. Here's what I'll tell you. You know, um, in my professional experience, one of the things that I've found and held, you know, very close to me is the importance of mentorship Um, and specifically looking for vulnerabilities within yourself um, Mm -hmm. and and going to seek individuals that are willing to tell you the truth because good feedback is good feedback. It makes us feel good. You know, we, 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 you know, end our day and go have dinner with our loved ones, whatever it might be. And we can be excited about that, but critical feedback moves the needle and Mm -hmm. open to that conversation and continuous development process is something that I've, you know, hold held near and dear to my heart. Um, But I've also sought mentors that are willing to give me that information in a way, which isn't just saying, Hey, you need to do better here, here, and here. Um, It started and ended with asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. They generally didn't tell me an answer. They just asked me questions. And I came to my own conclusions and it gave me an opportunity for critical thinking. And I, you know, I look at the market today, critical thinking is probably one of the greatest opportunities we have in the marketplace for any role across industry. Um, Because the the reason I say that is, is I think individuals have gotten to an assumption that there are a right and wrong answer to everything. And unfortunately, we live in gray 98% of the time. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, 
that's something that can be really, really hard for individuals. So trying to think your way through a problem to a solution has such a valuable opportunity um, in regards to career development and career health. Um, then the second piece is, is, you know, everybody asks, you know, what did you want to do when you grew up? And I don't always know that I have the answer to that. But mm -hmm. what I can tell you is, is that, you know, work is something that that needs to be interesting it needs to be complex and you need to be passionate about it and i see individuals you know especially individuals at my stage um, in their career where they're really looking for the next thing from a challenge standpoint and sometimes it's sitting right in front of you in the organization that you're in and instead of looking at you know in the eyes and saying hey you know this is truly what i want to accomplish you know, individuals look outside and that can be beneficial. Um, and it certainly can be valuable in regards to an experience standpoint. Um, but I don't think that there's any risk in, in looking down, you know, some of your greatest challenges within your organization and trying to make a meaningful impact. Yeah. I think that's where a, a meaningful career, we, we see so many people jump every one to two years, new place, new place, new place. But to your point, it's like, no, maybe facing some of those obstacles in that current role is exactly what you need for that next stage of growth or, or that next stage of kind of rekindling that passion. Yeah. Yeah. And like job transitions are, you know, one of the most stressful things that you can go through, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're almost certainly some of the most fulfilling moments for individuals if, if they step into the thing that they were truly intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's that that's an entirely different hours worth of conversation in regards to, you know, what Brady Johnson thinks of, you know, career transitions and, you know, what the opportunity is and is not. But um, yeah, I think, you know, what I look for at any given moment in time is continuous growth and development. And, you know, you got to be, you got to be excited about areas that you don't understand um, yeah. and be willing to lean into them. Right. Um, if not, like, you know, what's the point, you know, if you, if you know exactly what to do day in and day out to be successful and you can replicate it for the next 30 years, well, you know, depending on how complicated it is, maybe that's the best job in the world, but um, it sounds, sounds like, like automation. Of, yeah. It sounds <laughs> like a lot of monotony too. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Spot on. Now tell me a little bit about your current role at a light solutions. Yeah. Um, so within my organization, vice president of revenue operations and sales, um, I've been with the organization for a little over two years um, and we've gone through this, you know, kind of significant transformation. So I have sales technology, um, sales operations now transitioning into this RevOps focus, um, mm -hmm. project management. And then um, we also have a digital selling team as well. And um, <clears throat> between, you know, all of the components of that organization, it's it's really, you know, the opportunity to drive the best outcome for our sellers who in my mind are our customers in, mm -hmm. in most circumstances and trying to understand the greatest opportunities and greatest risks of their success and providing that information in a palatable way. Right. Um, Cause I think, you know, it's easy for us to say you need to do something different or better. It's very, very hard <laughs> to just consume that information on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, if you're thoughtful about it, you use data and you can provide them, you know, recommendation, right? Of saying, hey, here's the true opportunity. Um, and here's how you go do that. Um, well, that, that's a winning strategy for revenue operations. And then the, the digital sales side is something I'm super passionate about. And I think it's in part because that's where I started. Yeah. Um, and the secondary piece is, is, you know, the opportunity to provide a curated approach to career development is something that has so many foundational elements of success for the individual, as well as the organization that they serve. And if done right, you know, you see individuals that, and I have plenty of examples of this, but you see individuals that step into a role, build their fun fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. and I call it the build a bear strategy. Not everybody loves that I say that, but 
you know, you can build the fundamentals early on in their career and set some expectations of the hard work that they're going to have to do that nobody loves to do, right? And then you start to provide them more experiential moments in regards to their role change and how they take on more responsibility. Here's a career progression plan. Here's how you mm-hmm. can drive a result. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have these individuals step into field sales that are digital sales ready. And that's a super interesting capability. And, you know, yeah. I have a friend of mine who's also in the Fargo area who's continuously been, you know, one of the number one or, you know, kind of top 10 reps at a former organization that we both worked at. And a lot of his success has come from the fundamentals that he built. Now, you know, there's an inherent drive um, within this individual that, you know, he wants to be the best. Um, but a lot of the work that he did early on has driven his success over the course of the last five to 10 years. It's true. I mean, it's the foundation. And as you know, Malcolm Gladwell once said, right, 10,000 hours and all of that time working towards that, the, the chopping wood and, and carrying water that gets us to where we are. And I think sometimes we, we all have found and technology can even be at times that, that easy button to avoid maybe some of the hard parts. So it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. And with that, you know, one question I ask all my guests is introspective. You know, if you go back to college or take yourself back a few years, what's maybe one word of advice you'd give yourself now? Um, if you look back a little while. Yeah. That's a hard question to answer, actually. Um, you know, I think that there's a there's a thousand mistakes in my history, and there's there's likely to be a thousand more, I'd assume. Um, but if I look at it and like providing advice to myself, I think you know, if it's in college or even when I was young, um, sometimes you know, you go through you know, formal education, right? Yep. Um, some people have, some people haven't, but. Um, you know, say you go get a bachelor's degree. And I think one of the things that, you know, you start to set for yourself as an expectation is this good job with this good company, um, with an organization that's growing and there's this continuous opportunity. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think it prevents to a certain extent is thinking very critically about how you want to spend your day. Um, and I would challenge anybody in that, right? Like, this has been a wonderful conversation, but, yeah. you know, does, does everyone want to sit, you know, in a desk in 10 hours of meetings Monday through Friday? Well, the answer is, is a lot of people don't, right? Like, yeah. what, even if it's in their own community, they want to go out and meet with individuals. And there are, there are companies that, you know, provide that, right? Or they want to they want to drive betterment um, of an individual, whether it be health or financial or whatever it is. I think it's so easy for us to look at, hey, I want to have a great job and I want to have security. And and some of those things are, you know, to a certain extent in my mind a facade, right? I mean, mm-hmm. some of the most interesting conversations I have is with entrepreneurs and the most interesting conversations with entrepreneurs I have are individuals that didn't get through their higher education because they were so passionate yeah. and sometimes blind, um, but so passionate about what they wanted to accomplish that they were willing to take a level of risk that most individuals in this country are not willing to do. Yeah. And the amount of energy that I get from those conversations is, is something that I walk away and say, you know, like if only I had this level of energy, But it goes back to earlier in the discussion, find your passion and be unrelenting about it. I I love that. And if there's something that is so core to EQ, I didn't even have to ask you why EQ, why now? Because you hit it on the head and I don't think most people link this to it, but motivation, our self-motivation is so core to our emotional intelligence and to what we do in the world, how we interact and how we engage. And I think you hit it on the head with passion. So that to me, I have to have to finish out with one thing that I'm going to ask, even though we're going a little over time is what outside of work, what are some passions that, uh, that you like to do, Brady? Yeah, well, um, 
I'd love to say that, you know, most of my time is spent, you know, um, outside and outside of the four walls of my own home. Cause I love, uh, the outdoors, but it is, yeah. it is cold and we have four feet of snow right now. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I have two young sons that are, oh, you know, becoming more and more engaged in, in all sorts of activities. I have one that's getting excited about hockey, which, you know, anyone that has, is a hockey parent that's listening to this conversation, there's a thousand reservations that I have um, in regards to the time consuming nature of it all. Um, the, teeth, the, the teeth. I mean, come on. As a parent. <laughs> you have to protect yeah, yeah. 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 It turns <laughs> out we're not on uh, a hockey podcast, uh, but no, I think the other piece of it is, is like, for me, it's adventure, right? That's um, awesome. I'm yep. super passionate about seeing, you know, other parts of uh, culture at the end of the day, because there's so much we can learn about how individuals live within this country. Um, it's amazing to see the difference between the Midwest and, you know, the Southeast or the Northwest. Um, but it's also super interesting, you know, like you know, you're a um, result of your environment to a certain extent and yep. challenging your own assumptions is something that I find to be, wildly beneficial in my career. I think so. I think especially as we we scale and teams go more and more global, those cultural understandings are foundational, not only for ourselves to understand ourselves better, but also those that we work with. Now, I also happen to have done a little research. You work at a nonprofit or have, have built a, helped build a nonprofit and very connected to that as well. So I'd love you to give a shout out to that nonprofit work that you're doing, let people know about that. And then also where can everybody find you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've worked through a couple um, over the course of the last, you know, kind of 10 years. I have one that I'm super passionate about today. It's called Ben's Helping Hand. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually formed by um, some cousins of mine. They lost their son, uh, Ben, who was my cousin as well, um, to, to brain cancer. And one of the things that they found, which I found to just be wildly interesting, uh, unfortunate, uh, but wildly interesting because it's, it's something that I never thought about before. Um, but what they found was, you know, when individuals, families in particular, go through critical illness, one of the number one things that families will, you know, start to consider is obviously the financial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But when they start to look at budgeting and ensuring financial health and wellness, um, they start to cut costs in, in a precarious area. And food costs are one of those things. Um, and <clears throat> interestingly enough, I mean, anybody that's had a critical illness, anybody that's been sick for a period of time, um, you can probably argue the, the, you know, the true, you know, value of chicken noodle soup when you have a cold, but there are healing properties, right? And mm -hmm. what we do is we ensure that the families that are going through those experiences don't have to worry about one of the most fundamental things. Um, and one of the most critical things for anybody in this world, which is access to food. Um, yeah. So Ben's Helping Hand, it, it's actually, um, it's held by Dakota Medical Foundation. Wow. Um, and you can, you can find it, you know, you can search Dakota Medical Foundation. And if anybody has any interest of learning more, they can obviously contact me. Um, otherwise, there's information there if you search Ben's Helping Hand. That's tremendous. And, and so true. I mean, especially going through cancer, those things that absolutely wreck our bodies. If we're not yeah. uh, taking care of mind, body and soul, it's a... Uh, in no way to get better. So where can people connect with you? Yeah, uh, I'm a pretty, pretty open book for the most part. Uh, obviously, you know, if anybody has questions, I'm always happy to respond via LinkedIn. Um, there's also, you know, access to some of my, you know, kind of personal information in regards to shooting me an email um, or giving me a call. But LinkedIn is usually the best way to find, uh, find me and then engage in a conversation. And I'm always happy to jump on the line with anybody that might have questions. Perfect. And um, with that, Brady, I can't say enough. Thank you for an amazing session, for a great conversation. Um, everything from RevOps to, you know, understanding the, the needs of buyers and creating that customer experience, but more than anything about passion. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, looking forward to following Alight Solutions and all the work that you do there and hopefully staying and connecting uh, a few years from now to see if some of those predictions are coming true. 
Yeah. Hey, let's let's not make it another four years like the last time. And, you know, maybe we'll end up back in, you know, I don't even remember the city. What? It, it, a one horse town outside of T- Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> and so That's to all of our. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I hope so. And so to all of our guests, RevOps is not just a seven iron, as we found out uh, back on that trip. It takes a lot of listening, a lot of passion and a whole lot of problem solving and maybe facing those challenges that we have. So um, again, Brady, thank you so much. And uh, this has been another episode of B2B EQ. Uh, Listen where all podcasts are available or uh, go to unifor.com and we will see you next time. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.